Hi, I'm Maxime, and um, I want to talk today about timeouts. Uh, you see, I don't have really professional setup here, but I think I would be able to explain a few basic uh, temporal concepts uh, related to activity timeouts, and I think they you find this presentation useful. So let's start from the invocation. Usually in temporal, you have workflow worker. Which hosts workflow code and somewhere in your workflow, it will have execute activity. Statement. And in Go, it will be ex execute activity. In Java, it can look like invocation of activity over uh, activity interface. But at the end, it will be transformed into the schedule activity command, which is sent back to the temporal server. So if you have temporal server here, uh, it will command uh, as schedule activity command. And when we schedule an activity, we always have to specify at least two things. We need to specify activity type. Let's say it will be full in our case. And it's uh, also the required parameter is uh, activity task queue. Let's say bar. Even if you don't specify task queue explicitly, uh, it is always there. It usually defaults uh, to the task queue name, the same name as a workflow task queue. Besides activity ta and workflow task queues are separate inside of the server. So even if you use the same name, they're absolutely different um, instances of queues. So when we schedule an activity and what will happen is that two things will happen. First, there is so-called mutable state for a workflow instance which executing that, let's say it's workflow one. So it will be workflow one, so called mutable state, which contains information about the workflow. And inside of that mutable state, we will add information that this activity also will have ID. Let's say ID one. Activity ID one is scheduled and then we will put that activity into the task queue and this task queue will be the task queue we specified which is bar activity task queue as i said activity task queue and workflow task queue are separate so after we put let's draw it as after we, and this happens atomically. So we update the mutable state and we put it in task queue. So there is guarantee, atomic guarantee that they will happen together. Now, there is slight delay when a task uh, activity can appear in the task queue, but most important thing, it's a transactional queue. It's not possible to update mutable state and to not have a task queue scheduled or vice versa. It's not possible to have task queue without state being updated. So after that, we kind of usually expect that there is an activity worker an activity worker when we started it's always we need to specify task queue it listens on so in this case let's say it listens on the bar so it will receive messages from bar we use long pole to receive messages but it probably doesn't matter for this specific conversation and after it will receive that message, and we, we call it activity task, that message, it will start processing some according to whatever business logical that activity is. And after processing is done, activity worker go back to the temporal service and say complete activity task. Activity task and provide result of the activity execution. 
And then at this point, uh, the control will go back to the workflow and work execute activity call will unblock and go to the next line of code. But we don't want to really look at the how workflow does that at this point. And we're just talking about the activity invocation. So let's look, uh, let's look at the states of the activity. So practically, as we saw, activity after we put activity in task queue and updated the state, activity will be in scheduled state. After it's picked up by the worker, it will be in a started state. And then after uh, completion goes through, it will be well, a completed state also can be, be called closed state because it also can fail, not only complete. So if it's failed, it also can be closed state. So why are these states important? Because these states are used when we name timeouts. So after activity is picked up, it started, and then it executes, and at some point it will complete. But imagine that at the point when during the execution, this worker crashes. So activity is started, but it never will be completed because worker crashed. That's why we want to make sure that after some timeout. A workflow will learn or a system will learn to be able to retry it. So it, that timeout is called start to close timeout. And this is probably the most important timeout to, to remember. This is the timeout of a single activity invocation. Um, even if activity is retried, I will talk about retry in a second. But if activity is started, picked up by a worker, and until it completes, this is start to close timeout. And this timeout is the timeout we I recommend always set uh, to the appropriate value. And we'll discuss what is that appropriate value a little bit later. So what, uh, what will happen is by default, uh, any activity, scheduled activity has attached a retry policy. Uh, server side provides a default retry policy for every activity. So if activity times out or reported as failed, because it's also possible for the worker to call fail activity. Activity task. In this case, it's immediately failed and is subject to retry for the retry policy. Uh, if activity will be retried, what does retry mean in this case? It will be put into the task queue again and the counter will be incremented here. Let's say it's a second attempt. And then it will be picked up probably by a different worker because usually we have multiple worker processes listening on the same task queue. So this worker dies, another worker will pick it up, execute again and complete. If it fails again or dies again, this start to close timeout will fire again. But Usually when you invoke activity, you also want to sometimes limit the overall maximum overall time of activity execution. So how, for how long should it retry before reporting a failure to the workflow? And for that, we have scheduled to close timeout. So this timeout is overall time execution timeout. So it means that it, the activity can stay some time in the task queue if worker is down, then it picked up, then it fails, then it retries. The overall cycle from invocation to completion, this timeout limits that. So this is the timeout. Practically, you can think about the maximum time can activity can take execute with all possible failure scenarios and retries. That is the, this is kind of the most important uh, two timeouts for an activity. So for what, what would be the good value, for example, for start to close? The most important rule that start to close should be longer than maximum possible, like maximum time of activity, which uh, like maximum possible time of activity uh, execution. So if your activity on average takes five minutes, but can sometimes take five hours, it means that this timeout, start to close timeout should be over five hours. And this is a problem because if you have activity which is on average is fast, but sometimes is slow, you have to set this timeout to the maximum time. With what, it, what it also means that if your worker goes down, it will be retried only after that timeout or reported back to the workflow as failure if retry policy is, is exhausted. That is rarely what, what we want. We want to fa fail fast. 
So for that, uh, you can support heartbeat. We support heartbeating. And the expectation is that you will set heartbeat. Heartbeat timeout. And heartbeat timeout usually much, much shorter than start to close timeout. So if you have start to close of five hours, heartbeat can absolutely be one minute or even shorter. And the expectation is that uh, worker will heartbeat. Heartbeat within that timeout. And the heartbeat is actually should be done by the activity code. It doesn't happen automatically. So it means that if you are setting heartbeat timeout, your activity must heartbeat. You can heartbeat more frequently than heartbeat timeout, much more frequently because uh, SDK by, de by default throttles the heartbeats. Well, the uh, other interesting side effect of that is if, if you don't set heartbeat and then your process calls heartbeat, actually heartbeat calls will not happen because there is no reason to heartbeat if uh, heartbeat interval is very large. So. Uh, you should always set heartbeat if you're heartbeating from an activity. So, so far we see three timeouts. Start to close, as I said, it's time of the single activity attempt invocation. Schedule to close overall time of activity execution, including all retries. And heartbeat is the time between heartbeat calls for activities which can long uh, for a predictable amount of time. There is one more, uh, more heartbeat, which is actually used in a very specific, uh, sorry, one more timeout, which is uh, called a schedule to start timeout. And this timeout is, can be a little bit confusing to people. And because uh, I see that most of our uh, users of our system do set the timeout. And actually I don't recommend setting that almost ever. Let me explain why. L let me first explain why this timeout exists. Imagine situation when we want to route request to a specific worker. For example, you, you have file on this disk or there is some other reason and you have two separate boxes, let's say box one and box two, and you wanna actually run activity on box one, but not on box two, or sometimes you wanna run it in box two. How would you do that uh, using temporal? Uh, what you would do, you would create two task queues. So in this case, you will create task queue per box. So it will be box one, box two, because task queues are pretty lightweight. So you can create any number of them and they create it dynamically. So it's not a problem to have a lot of them. And then you will ask box one, listen on the task queue box one and box two, listen on task queue box two. And then when you schedule activity, you will just specify task queue box one, for example, to schedule, to route activity to appropriate to appropriate uh, process or it, not a necessary box, it can be process. For example, every time process restarts, you wanna uh, because you have, for example, in memory cache, you want a new identity. So in this case, you will uh, listen to a different task queue. So this works fine, but what will happen is if you schedule activity on box one and put it in task queue, and then this box crashes. This task will never be picked up because nobody ever will listen in, on this box. Again, and again, box is probably process can restart, but let's say it's a process ID or it's pod ID and uh, in Kubernetes and you've got different pod identity. So in this case, the service will sit there forever and will not have ever chance to report back to the workflow. For that, we have scheduled to start uh, timeout. This timeout is a timeout for queue timeout, probably queuing timeout. How long message uh, or task, uh, activity task can stay, in, stay inside of the task queue. And that timeout is very useful in this case because you probably can say, yes, after one minute, if this never was picked up, go report it back to the workflow and then it can go and reschedule, for example, to a different box. Or in most cases, because we are out in, it will probably will re reschedule the whole activity, uh, set of activities or do some other compensations. But it is a mechanism to learn that uh, this will be never picked up. So in that situation, it's very useful. But uh, setting that timeout 
for situations when you have multiple uh, processes, multiple workers, uh, worker processes listening in the task queue, doesn't make much sense. Because what will happen is that this timeout is not, uh, is not retrieval. Why? Because what does it mean to retry it? For example, we put this in a box one queue, it times out, and then we will retry it back into the same task queue. It's the same as practically doing any, nothing. So you do nothing. You just take message out of the task queue and put it here. And it's uh, practically just doing no work for without actually a, 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 any externally visible result, especially as task queues don't guarantee any ordering of delivering the tasks. That's why schedule to start timeout is not retriable. Uh, so if you specify, for example, retry policy, which has, uh, for example, schedule to close of two hours because you want to retry for two hours and then specify schedule to start for two, 10 minutes uh, and the message is not picked up from the task queue for 10 minutes because your workers were down for 15, then this message will time out even if a schedule to, clo uh, schedule to close is actually uh, very long. So in most cases, unless you're doing task route into specific boxes, I do not recommend to specify schedule to start. Then it will practically will time, uh, default to the schedule to close which means that you'll stay in the queue until uh, the maximum time activity is allowed to execute. And in real life, you also want to have uh, metrics and alarms on uh, messages staying in task queue for a long, for long time. That's why usually it's a good idea to um, just uh, fix your workers and uh, not to time out those messages. I think I covered everything I wanted to close in this, to cover in this session. Let me just kind of repeat, maybe repeat that again. Most important thing to understand that activity goes through three main states, scheduled, start and closed, started and closed. Uh, that activity, a single attempt of activity uh, execution is a start to close timeout. And this timeout I always recommend to set. And it should be as large as the longest possible time to execute an activity. Uh, for long run activities, we, we, I recommend to set heartbeat timeout and, the, uh, and then heartbeat, obviously activity has to heartbeat in this case. Uh, then we have scheduled to close timeout because activity has attached retry policy and unless you limit it, uh, you, for retry policy, you can say maximum number of attempts of one, then it will not be retried, but otherwise it will be always retried. And the overall time of all retries and also time activity staying in task use is limited by schedule to close timeout. And then schedule to start timeout is a timeout which is used to, uh, it allow, uh, limits num um, amount of time a message can stay in the task queue. And this timeout is used mostly when you need to route to specific processes. I think this concludes this session, thank you. <laughs>